You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. This is Dead But Not Gone with host Toby Evans. Dead But Not Gone shares an aspect of the afterlife that is typically not considered, that loved ones or strangers that have died may still be here, impacting your life more than you realize. So now, please welcome the host of Dead But Not Gone, Toby Evans. Hello, everyone. I'm Toby Evans, your host. Thanks for joining me tonight to hear Dead But Not Gone on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Today, we're going to go soul diving into the deep unconscious, where we'll be talking about brainwaves and dreams. But first, let me make sure that our back brain and our front brain are communicating properly. So how the heck do we do that? Well, it's pretty simple. We're going to do a modified version of an Eden Energy Medicine technique that's called the Wayne Cook. It's named after a biochemist who originally formulated this to address stuttering. So hopefully I'm not going to stutter, but it's really going to help with our brain connectivity. When our energies get scrambled, the brain and the related energies get disconnected, and that prevents the assimilation and the storage of new information. So we're going to do a version of the Wayne Cook that can be done standing up as well as sitting down. So you get to choose whichever is easier for you. It works just as well sitting up. So if you want to stay sitting, stay there. So bring your arms straight out in front of you with both palms facing outward. Now you're going to lift your right arm over your left and clasp your hands together. Take your clasp hands and swing them into your chest so they're tucked right up underneath your chin. Now if you look down, you should notice that your left arm is on top. So cross your right foot over your left, right at the ankle. This is a little bit more of a a balance challenge if you're standing, but it's pretty easy if you're sitting. Or if you have any restrictions or disabilities with either your arms or your legs, just envision that you're doing it. Now, breathe in slowly through your nose as you lean back in your chair, or if you're standing, tip back, and take a nice deep breath. And as you exhale, you're going to lean forward and blow the air out through your mouth. So think of yourself as a human billows because you're going to continue to do this. Lean back, inhaling, lean forward, exhaling. You're going to keep repeating this while I give you some kind of an understanding about it. And you're breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. This is a great thing to do if you've been under pressure or if your nervous system feels really taxed or if you're feeling overwhelmed or just over emotional or upset for no particular reason. It's also good for those times when we can't think clearly or we can't recall or retain information. A good example of that would be if you're laying there reading a book at night and you realize you don't have any clue what you've just been reading. Okay, it's time to turn off the light and go to sleep or else do a Wayne Cook. Okay, you can stop rocking, uncross your feet, and then uncross the arms. And now you're going to place your arms out in front of you again with your palms facing out. And this time you're lifting your left arm over the right. Clasp your hands again. Swing them in towards your chest. Tuck them again underneath your chin. This time when you look down, that top arm is the right one. 
Okay, and once again, you're going to take and cross at the ankles. Okay, so you're crossing your left foot this time over your right. Lean back to inhale as you breathe in through the nose and exhale as you lean forward, blowing it out the mouth. If you are dyslexic, or sometimes have a problem with reversing your letters or numbers, or if you do stutter, then this exercise is great for you. It's also a wonderful thing to do before you're studying or trying to learn something that you really want to absorb. Or if you need to have an important conversation and it feels like it's a difficult one and you want to be really clear and not misunderstood. And it's also really almost critical to do this if you're the one that's trying to impart information to others, like standing before a class teaching. If you're scrambled, everyone that listens to you is being scrambled too. Okay, stop rocking, uncross your arms and your legs, and now we're going to do the last part. Steeple all your fingers together, and you're going to rest the thumbs together at your third eye. This is just above the bridge of your nose. Hold this while you breathe in again, nice and deep, in through the nose, out through the mouth. And then on that last exhale, you're going to slide your thumbs over to your temples, which naturally makes your fingertips kind of curl in to line up down the middle of your forehead. Slowly, you're going to push in and with pressure, you're going to pull your fingers apart like you're separating a curtain that's at your third eye. Actually, we're making room here at our third eye doing this. You're going to be stretching the skin above your eyebrows, dragging your fingers all the way out to your temples. Now, come back to the center, placing your fingers at your hairline so you're a little higher up than you were before. Press down with pressure and then pull them apart again, all the way over to the sides above the temples. Keep repeating this, but we're going to move up to the head. So now come right to the center of your head, pressing down with some firmness, pulling apart like you're pulling at those suture lines. Now move your hands to that curve at the back of the head and come down, pressing down, pulling apart, dropping your hands now down to the back of your head, about the range of the occiput. Pull apart again here. And now continue all the way down until you reach the base of your neck. Do it once more there. Now, once you're at your shoulders, I want you to just hang there and massage them. This last part that we just did is called the crown pull. And the crown pull can help release stuck energy when we spend too much time in our heads, which a lot of us do. Or if you're on the computer a lot, this is really helpful. It's a subtle cranial adjustment that helps to pump the cerebrospinal fluid back into the brain, and it helps to oxygenate the brain. Now slowly bring your hands down in front of you, cross your arms over the opposite shoulder, and slowly slide your hands down the back of your arms until you're holding your opposite elbows. You might feel like a Russian dancer, except I'm not going to ask you to kick your legs up high. But feel that stretch, really pull as you're holding both up your elbows. That stretch is happening right in the middle of your back. Now you can nod your head like I dream of Jeannie, because that's what you look like right now. But instead of thinking, your wish is my command, say to yourself, I am enough. And let go, sliding your hands towards your wrist, pulling the energy off each hand. And just return to your own breathing. Energetically, we have just opened our third eye and our crown chakra, making room for higher inspiration and information that might lie in your unconscious, allowing it to make its way up to the forefront of your minds. This is an appropriate thing to do as we get ready 
to go into this week, which we're kind of in that dearth, death and rebirth corridor that's leading up to Easter. And we're also going into a partial lunar eclipse tomorrow. So eclipse energy can help us to align with our true and higher path. When the moon passes behind the earth during a lunar eclipse, it highlights or it brings things to the forefront that we haven't been able to look at clearly. So whatever that is for you, take advantage of these next hours overnight. In the time zone that I'm in, that eclipse is going to happen tomorrow morning, like at 647 or something, you know, but you all can calculate it wherever you are in the world. So nature naturally turns within at this time, and that creates an inward pull on our consciousness. It's from that introspective place that we can best receive information or a message that's being sent from our souls. A common way that we all experience the subtle transfer of information is through our dreams. There are many scientific theories about why we dream. Some say that dreams are expressing our repressed childhood longings or that we're sorting through the garbage of our day-to-day existence, or symbolically rehashing the long-standing problems and issues connected to the karmic patterns in our lives that we might not have any conscious awareness about at all. Other scientists believe that dreams are just random brain impulses. But as it happens, no one seems to really know exactly what they are. Although we often have trouble remembering our dreams, our dreaming selves have full access to our deep unconsciousness, and that includes all that the soul has been through in our past. When people come to me for a hypnotherapy session, I talk to them about brainwaves because it helps them understand that all hypnosis is really self-hypnosis. It's the power of their own mind that enables them to relax and let go. And you've got to be in a relaxed and letting go place in order to get to a deeper state. When we are wide awake and active and alert, we're in that beta brainwave. And if you saw this like a sine wave on a screen in front of you, you would be seeing these nice, steady, high uh, peaks that come up where I like to make my sound effects and go, you're seeing blip, 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 blip as it's moving along that screen. And at those high points where it's nice and close together, that's information that's available to us to our five senses, and it's what we draw on all day from that left brain. Now, when we start to relax and go into even a light alpha state, that means that that sine wave of that tight, high points coming up starts to relax, and you start to see more of a wave that looks like a nice, easy wave. And as you go deeper into that alpha state, you're going into deeper relaxation and maybe even meditation. So the alpha state governs our daydreams and fantasy, and it denotes a detached or a really relaxed state of consciousness. I think that we're in alpha, light alpha at least, a lot more than we are even aware. When we're driving, for instance, on a regular routine that we travel often, we easily slip into alpha and start processing all kinds of things or daydreaming or thinking about whatever, but we are definitely in a much more relaxed state. So alpha is a bridge between beta, the wide awake state, and theta. Theta is that first brainwave stage that we encounter when we're dreaming. And the theta brainwaves can be considered the subconscious. They govern the part of our mind that lies between the conscious and the unconscious, and it retains our memories and our feelings, as well as directs our beliefs and our behaviors. 
So by the time you get to this theta state, if you saw that with the sine wave, you're in these nice, open, almost U-looking shapes. And just think, when you're in that U-looking shapes, that's all information accessible to you that's not accessible to you when you are wide awake in beta. So I'm going to talk a lot more about this, leading where we're going with this dream. But first, we need to take a break. So stay here with us. You're listening to Dead But Not Gone here on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Toby Evans. Stay with me. I'll be right back. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Leip is a renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support, to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion, and then together we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAndAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. And we're back. I'm Toby Evans, and you are listening to Dead But Not Gone here on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I'm talking to you about brainwaves and dreams. So it's not so hard to imagine that with your dreamscape connected to the subconscious, that it could serve as a carrier wave for an SOS signal coming from an earthbound spirit. See, you knew there had to be a connection with this dreaming stuff in earthbound spirits, and there is. So if a past life aspect of yourself was caught in the loop of another lifetime, well, then the dream state would be a really good and non-threatening way to get your attention. This is what happened with Cindy Welsh, who is my guest tonight. Cindy had a dream in her 30s. And it made no sense to her in her current life. But it was so powerful that she couldn't dismiss it. The dream continued to replay, and I'll use the word, haunt her in her waking state over and over again until in her early 50s, she came to me for a past life regression. Cindy had no idea that beyond looking for clarification to verify the dream, that she was also coming to meet the dream messenger from her deep unconscious and lend assistance to this earthbound aspect of herself. She also would learn how much this aspect had impacted her current life choices. Cindy was a paramedic for 30 years and concurrently worked as a sheriff deputy and a SWAT officer and a medic and has 20 years of karate under her belt. I know, it's a bad pun. Okay, her service work continues currently as a registered nurse. So, Cindy, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. I'm really excited to talk to you about all of this. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you. 
So, Cindy, first of all, I want to ask you where you stood on even the whole subject of reincarnation at the time of your dream, because we know that we've got a 20-year gap between these two things. So when you were in your 30s and first had that dream, did the idea of past life even jump in? And when did that start even kind of making itself known to you as a possibility? I'd always been a person yeah, I had always questioned kind of, you know, what life is all about, what happens after you die, things like this. Um, the place that I grew up in was mainly a Christian environment, which there's nothing wrong with that, but reincarnation and that kind of thing was not a part of that. And so didn't really give it a whole lot of thought until I was an adult and working as a paramedic. And I had several friends, and we would sit and discuss, you know, what we think life mm -hmm. is all about kind of thing. And you know, that had come up a few times, but none of us really, you know, knew for a fact or really give it a, a whole lot of thought. I first thought about it when I was 28 on another trip that I was on, but that was the first time I'd been introduced to it. <clears throat> but I uh, really never gave it much thought and really thought there was anything to it. I didn't have any proof of it, so I kind of dismissed it. So when I had the dream, I really didn't know if I really could say I believed in past lives of any kind. Okay. So you didn't have any context, though, for the dream. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, the dream was uh, totally out of the blue. I don't, as a general rule, remember my dreams on a daily basis by any means. And so when I had this one and I woke up, um, at first I was very confused. And sometimes when you wake up, in the, I don't know if anybody else does this, but I wake up and you don't know where you're at and who you are for just a moment. It was kind mm -hmm. of like that. And then I sat there and I started thinking about what the dream was about and was very confused because I thought uh, it had to do with uh, World okay, War so, II. So go ahead and, you know, we're going to clue in the audience and I want okay. you to give us the dream as if you're okay. remembering it because I know it's pretty vivid for you. So just go yeah, ahead and recount the dream, where it started and what all, you know, uh, details you picked up at that point. Okay. The dream was really pretty brief when you think about it um, with what was in it and how quick it happened, but there was very key points in it. It kind of happened in two segments. Um, started off with uh, I was standing in a line. Uh, I was a young girl standing in a line with a bunch of other women. Um, I knew I was Jewish, and I knew I had just arrived in a concentration camp, and I was very afraid. I was standing in this line with other women, and they were pushing dresses at us, and there was an SS officer standing up ahead, and he was motioning to the right or left. I didn't know what it meant, and I was walking towards him. I was very confused about everything that was going on. And as I was getting closer to him, and he looked at everyone there with a kind of a look of contempt. You could tell he really didn't think much of anyone there at all. And as I approached him, behind him another officer came in. And for just a moment, um, we looked at each other. And he had a different look at me than this other officer did. And as I approached, this first officer motioned me to go to my right. Um, as I started to do that, the other officer stopped me and motioned me to go the other way. Well, the dream stopped right there, and then it moved ahead in time. Um, don't know really how far in, into the future it went, but it was months, maybe even a year ahead, and I was standing in a woman's barracks that was part of this camp. Mm -hmm. um, what I knew at that time was that I had survived thanks to this second officer, that when he had directed me to go the other direction, that kept me from going to my death or to hard labor, I guess you could say. All of it was hard labor, but some of it was worse than others. And um, what I did for him was I worked for him. And so in the second part of the dream, I'm standing in the women's barracks with my back to the wall. There's other women prisoners in front of me. And they're very angry. And I know that part of the reason that I survived was sort of being a housekeeper to this officer. But also, there was sex involved. I was basically a prostitute to him. Also, the, the term brothel was in my head at the time as well, which for me in, in this life was a very strange term. It's not something I heard every day or even thought about. Um, in this second part of the dream, I knew that the second officer who had protected me all this time, that something he had he was gone suddenly i didn't know where didn't know why but i knew my protection was gone and so i not only had the germans that hated me but also the other prisoners because they saw me as a traitor 
for what I did to survive. And mm-hmm. these women that were surrounding me were, uh, while I still had my hair, and although I'd lost weight, I wasn't as um, starving as they were. Emaciated. <laughs> yeah, you and, weren't emaciated, and they were. No, exactly. And they were bald, and they were very sickly. And they were very angry, like I said, and they were in front of me, and they were kind of moving towards me and saying things like, you know, very hateful things. And the dream just stopped. And so when I woke up, that was when I was confused as to what was going on. Okay. So what happened? So we're talking about 20 years before you even get the idea, you know, to even check this out from a past life perspective. So what started unfolding in your 3D world of little things that were coming up that started filling this in? Because as you told me, this was haunting you in the waking state where it kept coming back at different times. I know it wasn't a daily event by any means, but it kept coming back. So well, tell us about was, that. I um, After a while, when it kept kind of coming back to me, I didn't write it down at first because I thought it was just kind of a crazy dream. And the things that had happened in it, I thought, well, that couldn't have happened in a concentration camp. Um, there are different things like also the thing in the dream that um, was in my mind was about the train that came into the building and found that very odd. Um, so I, when it kept coming back to me, I finally decided, well, I'm going to see if I can find something about this. So all I could do was go to a library. There was no internet at the time. There was really nothing to really research except the library. And I went there, couldn't find anything. And so then it was uh, sometime later, I happened to be in a bookstore, and I wasn't even thinking about anything to do with this dream about that time frame, nothing, and was at a um, clearance rack, and it had all kinds of books, um, fiction and nonfiction, all kind of just jumbled together. I don't even know why I stopped there. And as I was looking through it, a small, thin paperback book that was black had a number on the side and something in a different language, and the title said House of Dolls. Now, even as a child, I didn't care for dolls, didn't play with dolls. It was not my thing. Um, Why I reached that book, I still don't know. I pulled it out, and on the front of it was the picture of what I thought was was Auschwitz, is how I always knew it, and it's the, the gate of death. And... It kind of shocked me because I didn't know what House of Dolls had to do with that. Well, I flipped it over, and as I read the back, it was supposedly a true story based on a diary of a girl who had been in a camp, and actually in the same camp, that had been a prostitute. And Mm -hmm. I nearly dropped the book, but I bought it right away. I took it home, and I read it. There was not a lot of things in it that was similar except for that. Um, It was kind of a strange written book, and I did research that book some more, and it's, it's got some debate on whether it's really a true story or something that was made up. But it was the first time I'd seen anything that even had anything to do with anything like that. And that's when I first began to think, well, is there something more to this? Could this have actually happened in this camp? And no one has ever talked about it. And that's when I really became more curious about it and wondered if it was a past life. Mm. Okay. And then how did you open up to the possibility of past lives to even begin uh, to consider that well i had i've always been like i said curious about things that are unexplained and i've read a lot about all the religions of the world i'm not an expert on any of them but i've always been curious about why people believe what they believe and reincarnation when i'd read books on it i've i got i've read a lot of books on it but i'd read it and it seemed like it it made more sense than anything i'd ever come across to explain our life here and it also explained more you know as a paramedic seeing people die a lot it made me think more that Maybe there was something to that as well. But Dr. Brian Weiss's his books, I'd read those, and, and those really seemed to make a lot of sense to me. And I liked the fact that he was a doctor, that he had a scientific mind. And I've been one of those people, too, that if you can't prove it in a scientific way, then it's not true. And so nothing in religions can you prove, and nothing in reincarnation can you prove. And so when I in 2005, I came across another book that came out that was called Auschwitz. And that book was the one that when I read it, it validated everything in the dream about the brothels, about um, you know, sex in the camps, the officers being attracted sometimes to Jewish women, <clears throat> the train coming into the building. Um, in the dream, Auschwitz was part of it, but the camp I was in started with a B, and that also confused me as to why Auschwitz was always a part of it, but that wasn't the name of the place I was in. And so Great. I really kind of 
you know, research some more, but that book really, you know, kind of nailed it shut for me that there was a whole lot to this and the stuff I didn't know at the time of the dream, I now had validation for in this book. And that made me want to know more. Was this a past life? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to find out what happened when Cindy came and did the past life right after we take this break. So stay tuned. You're going to hear a lot more about this dream and about what she discovered in the past life. You're listening to Dead But Not Gone here on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Toby Evans, and I'll be right back. Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from Friends International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866-244-5679 and feel the glory. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. And we're back. You are listening to Dead But Not Gone here on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Toby Evans, and I am talking to Cindy Welsh today. And she is telling us about a dream that she had in her 30s that she did a lot of uncovering of information to be able to get to the bottom of what was this dream telling her. So before we took a break, Cindy was telling us about a book that she found about Auschwitz that was confirming a lot of the things in the dream. And so, Cindy, pick up there and tell us the uh, surprising thing that you began to say, the B, you know, the word that began with the B didn't match Auschwitz. So go ahead. Right. And so what I did was, as I was reading this book and studying more on Auschwitz, um, it did find out that Auschwitz I, which is the camp that has the gate that has work will set you free and the iron work, but that, during the time of these, this camp, they also began to expand, and they built a second camp. And that camp was also where the women's camp was, and that was called Birkenau. And when I saw that, that's exactly the B name that was in the dream. And then I knew another validation that that's where I had been at. And then the <laughs> fact that the train coming through the building, that is also what is known as the gate of death that's there at Birkenau. And that is not something you find at every camp. That is very specific to that camp. Hmm. Well, that was good confirmation. So why did yeah. you decide? I Was it 2013 when you came to me, Cindy? Remind me of I, the year. I think it was. I think it was 2013 or 2014. I, okay. It might have been 2014. And I had been thinking about it more, and I researched more, and I just began to really think that more there was more to reincarnation. Um and I happened to be watching TV one day, and Dr. Brian Weiss was on the Oprah show, and he was talking about his experiences and how skeptical he was and then the experience he had and what made him believe in, in past lives. And I thought, oh, I wish I could have gone to him for a past life regression, and he could see if this is what this was. And for some reason, I reached over and picked up my laptop at that time, and I just 
because there's nobody around here that I know <clears throat> that does that kind of thing. And so I just typed in, does anybody do past life regressions in Kansas? And that's when I found you. Okay. So when you came to me, Cindy laid out and told me the whole dream. So we knew that going in and we knew what we were looking for is just to see, okay, is there anything to this? Is this really part of her past life or is it just, you know, she's pulling this from somewhere else. So Cindy, go into the part where you're recounting now the regression when we got to that part and we will skip the part that we did a lot of stuff leading up to going into this but Cindy take us into that yeah um, it was a very interesting experience for me um, like I said I have a very skeptical mind about things and the whole time we were doing this and I began to go into this regression a part of my brain kept saying is there really anything to this you know this is kind of crazy but another part of me was like you know let's just see what happens and I kind of opened my mind to it and it began with um, that I had lived in Poland with my mother and father and it was uh in a violin shop and at some point the Germans came and we were forced into trains it seemed like it was about a two-day ride in the trains and then into the camp and, and so were you that with on, your parents at that point going into the well, all of you yeah go ahead we, as we were going towards the trains uh, we got separated and I never saw them again and um, it, it was just kind of uh, shocking to me because that was so vivid in my eyes as we were doing this and I remember still my critical left brain kept coming in going you're making this up but it was so vivid and it was so real and the emotions that were with it it felt a whole lot like the dream had been mm -hmm. and which was very powerful and all the five senses engaged and so as we went through that we just heard my name and his name the second officer mm -hmm. and tell us that um, my name was Elena, and his mm -hmm. was Heinrich. Now, Heinrich is a very common German name, but as I did in research after the regression, I found out some interesting things um, yeah. about who this officer could have been. Yeah. And so, so then continue. as the dream went on, yeah. as we went on, the thing that really shocked me the most was we moved forward into the dream to where I was in the women's barracks with these women. And where the dream had stopped in the regression, it continued on. And I remember as it was unfolding, it really shocked me. Um, because and go back to the go back to the line part, Cindy, because you were able to in the regression relive the whole part that you did in your dream. And so was that sort of feeling like, oh, I am just making this up because this is just feeding the same thing that I saw in my dream, or did it seem like it was filling in pieces for you when you got to that part where you were actually going through the line? Oh, it, it definitely started filling in more details. Uh, it was definitely filling it out some. Um, if I remember right, um, in the regression, you know, we, we talked about moving through the line and this kind of thing and the the moving and that I became a housekeeper for him. That's mm -hmm. how I found, you know, that part out and the whole bit. Um, and and like also I said, I he, was, he was more or less professing his love for you. Yeah, there you know. was parts of that to where, yeah, he, he would say things like this was in my mind that he would say things um, that he really didn't agree with everything that was going on, but he really didn't have much of a choice and that he really did love me and that he was hoping that after the war, when this was all over, we could be together, this kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. yeah, and how were you taking that? Well, I didn't know how to believe it because he seemed to be kind of very self-centered and he would go on about the issues that he had, not seeing that the, the predicament I was in was a whole lot worse with the people around him. But I didn't quite trust him because when he was with the other officers, you know, he was just as bad as they were, I guess you could say. And But alone, he was different, so it was hard to know what to trust. Okay, so tell us before you get to the barracks, what happened that, because in the dream, you knew something took him away and you didn't have any idea what that was. So tell us what got filled in in right. the dream. At one point, I went to go to, to where he, his place had been where I went most every day, and there was an officer there, an SS officer, who stopped me and said, he's not here, he's been sent away, and sent me away to the barracks. And okay. so... I didn't really know exactly why he had, but I knew he'd been sent away mm -hmm. suddenly. Okay, you're back in the barracks now. 
Yeah, and so I'm standing there, and as they're saying these things, the dream continues to move forward, and as they come at me, even though they're very weak and sick, and they begin to, to hit at me, and I try to block it, and but the, the group of them moving towards me, I end up falling backwards, and I hit my head, and that was how I died. And I okay. remember in the regression that really amazed me because I never would have thought that in the, everything that could have happened within this camp, that that's how I would have died. Yeah. In other words, you were assuming because you were in a concentration camp that you died in the gas chambers. Right, or at the hands of the Germans somehow. Right. And I remember right That's... before this happened, this uh, extreme feeling of sadness because I couldn't convince them that what I had done was to survive, that mm-hmm. I think they would have done the same thing I had if they were in my shoes. Um, but I also did not hate them for it. I understood their anger, and they were in an awful situation as well. But it was just right. the ultimate sadness that I felt. Yeah. And you were also able to see, because as soon as we realized that you died at that point, you were then no longer in the body. You were outside the body, able to see this from a little bigger perspective. So, and from that perspective, I think is when I asked you, did you cross over? You know, where did you go once you're out of the body? And what did you discover? Um, That I had not crossed over. Okay. That that part had stayed. And I think that's what had always been impacting me in my life. Yeah. And it was also an interesting thing that that you tried to check on Heinrich to see where did he go? Because you were able to do that out of body. Right. You know, to to find out. And what did you find out? But didn't really know. Really couldn't find out exactly what happened with him, but mm-hmm. he was never caught. He was never prosecuted. Um, mm-hmm. Just kind of disappeared. Right. Okay, so at that point, this was all new to Cindy because she's coming to me for past life regression, opening herself up enough to even to believe in past lives. And now I'm introducing a whole different concept to her that this aspect of herself may never have crossed over. So we went into that portion of it to help Elena cross over. So I think that was a little um, discombobulating for you just because, you know, yeah, you were. So tell me what your reaction was when we were doing all of that. Well, as you began to do that, I had never heard of anything quite like that. And at first I was thinking, okay, this is kind of crazy. And I don't really know if I agree with this or what I what I think about this. But I thought, once again, I knew you were a person who had dealt with a lot of this, and, and I trusted you, and so I you know, went along with it. But there was a part of me that was very skeptical and kind of going, what are we doing? But uh-huh. then when we got to a certain part, there was a very um, profound moment for me that once again had that same kind of feel that I'd had with the dream and different things like that to where um, I'm pretty sure that that was, um, yeah, it was a very important part. And, it did and I think, and I think what happened, um, the part where, that you're talking about, is what I did with Elena is I traced the labyrinth. And remember, Cindy is laying down, you know, in a regression. So I'm finger tracing this kind of above her and explaining what I'm doing. I'm opening up a portal. I'm creating this octahedron over her to call in the angels to assist us in this. But it was calling in Elena's higher self, And I explained to Cindy, we're going to do that by inviting a male and a female aspect of her to come in and to be able to welcome her to that home of light, to be able to take her through the portal and be her her guardians and guides to get her all the way through that. And it was at that point when that came in, and Elena was ready to go, that's when you had the moment, Cindy, because tell us what you were feeling when she was actually, because I asked Elena, is there anything you want to say to Cindy? Okay. And you were just having that kind of moment, seeing her or feeling her separate from yourself, very different than being in the regression where you are her. Right. Right. And what it was was uh, in my in my mind, I was seeing her walk towards a, kind of a door of light. I don't know how to describe it. 
And mm-hmm. as she was walking towards it, I kind of had this feeling of, of kind of sadness, but she turned around and looked at me and she smiled. And mm-hmm. the smile told me it was okay and that she was fine and that's what she needed to do. And it was yeah. just really kind of a moving thing to see that happen. Yeah. Okay, so just stay with us. We need to take a break, and we're going to come back and do kind of the follow-up of what Cindy discovered after this regression. So you're listening to Dead But Not Gone here on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Toby Evans, and we'll be right back. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication-free. This full-service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Weight No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Weight No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Weight No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Weight No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. Horses, mystical, present, past, and future, all in one. Wild, free, domestic, and healing for everyone. Betty Hames knows this and has put her horses to good use with Nature Connect Equine Coaching. Her mission is to help people affected by the loss of hope and trust in their lives and to rediscover the wonders of nature through nature-connected learning so they can rebuild their lives and live peacefully with newfound hope, trust, and joy. Betty Hames is also a certified elite life coach, a Washington State certified counselor, and chemical dependency professional. She is passionate about partnering nature with healing, and through horses, she sees amazing results and transformation in lives that might have otherwise been lost. Call 509-830-9225 and visit her at HamesLifeCoaching.com. Hold your horses. You're in for the ride of your life. And we're back. You are listening to Dead But Not Gone here on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Toby Evans, and I am with Cindy Welsh, and she is telling us about her past life that has been really confirming what took place in a dream for her. So, Cindy, tell us now at this point when you already were through the whole regression and afterwards when you had time to let this really integrate you know how, could you feel any difference with no longer having elena as part attached to you well i have to say that um i was as you know when i came to tell you about this i didn't talk about this to a whole lot of people because when mm. i did i would get very emotional and since that time i can now talk about it without becoming extremely emotional and um that that makes a big difference i think there's probably feel like I can understand things better, maybe as to why things happen in this world the way they do. So I think that all helped me with that. Um, I'm a person who likes to try to prove things still. And so I, with this name Heinrich, I thought, well, I'm going to see if there was any officers, which of course, that's a very common German name. But I went and researched. And one of the things that I found that kind of shocked me was there was a, a Heinrich Opelt that was there. I could never find exactly the time frame that he was there. But his, his title was Director of Camp Labor which would make sense to me as the person who could possibly come in and choose different people to go different places and work. And yeah. But what's interesting about that was um, when I tried to find out what happened to him, because a lot of these officers, you know, some of them were, were found mm-hmm. and tried, um, all they could ever say was fate unknown. Mm-hmm. So never had any idea what happened to him. Yeah. So okay, so tell us what took place then in 2015 and where this bubbled up from inside of you. Well, ever since this had kind of started moving towards that I felt this was a past life, I thought I would really like to go back to Auschwitz and to Birkenau and actually just go there. And I had talked about it for several years and mentioned it to different friends, and I had friends I'd travel with, but nobody was really going to be able to go. And so I happened to be talking to my niece one day. And I told her, I said, you know, she knew about all my different trips. I've traveled quite a bit. 
And I told her, I said, I'm going to go to Poland. I want to go to Auschwitz. And I'd never told her anything about this dream or anything. And she said, oh, I've always wanted to go there. And I said, you did? I said, because I never knew that about her. Well, it turned out that she had always, she'd researched camps and stuff, these concentration camps when she was younger a lot. So I just kind of jokingly said, you ought to go with me. And she said, oh, I'd love to. Well, we hang up, and it was a few days later. She texts me, and she said, how much would something like that cost? Well, long story short, her and I ended up going to Poland together Mm -hmm. for a week. And um, it was kind of an interesting whole situation. Her belief system is not one that believes in reincarnation, but she also respects that people have differing opinions. So, you know, going with her was, was very different because it wasn't somebody I was going with that believed in past lives. But we went there, and, and the interesting thing was is when trips like this come about for me, they all fall into place without a hitch, and this one sure did. And so the next thing you know, we're, she's down in Texas, and I'm here in Kansas. And so we were meeting in Houston, Texas at the airport. Hurricane Bill came along and messed things up for us. And so we ended up missing our flight from Houston to go to Poland. So we had a 24-hour delay, and then when we get to Poland, they have completely lost our luggage. So we spent the entire trip without any luggage. And there was kind of an odd thing that happened when we were trying to find our luggage when this was first going on. This lady in the airport said, well, sometimes these things happen for a reason. And I thought she was nuts because I was like, losing your luggage, there's a good reason for that. Anyway, as we go uh, on our trip, the main thing was was going to the camps. And so we end up, we requested a private tour, didn't know what that would mean other than having our own guide. And so we go there, and as we first went to the Auschwitz, the first camp, um, it was very familiar, but I thought, well, I've looked at so many pictures, and, of course, the pictures are identical to what you're seeing there. And we went all through it, and it, I don't think anybody can go there and not be moved by it. So I didn't really feel that I was feeling anything different than anybody else would. At one point, we're standing there looking at the room with all the suitcases in it, and I had this brief sudden thought that, you know, in the past life, I had come to this camp and everything was taken away. Mm-hmm. And here I stand again, not the same thing, but, you know, I'm basically standing there with the clothes on my back. And mm-hmm. it just kind of had a very strange synchronicity feel to me. And I thought, well, it is perfect to be back here again with basically nothing. I do have my freedom. You know, I'm not, I can leave. But it was just a very strange kind of synchronicity there. So when we go over to Birkenau and we go into it, it's been raining and thundering and all day long and it's very overcast and ominous looking and we go inside and the trip was our private tour is late in the day this is also around the summer solstice and people in poland celebrate that so basically we kind of almost had the camp to ourselves with our guide and as we're going through all this we came around and went towards the women's barracks and as we're approaching that you know i was you know wondering what you know it would feel like to be back in one of those barracks And up to that point, like I said, I really hadn't had anything major happen that made me go, oh, my gosh, you know, this is just, you know, overwhelming. We go into the barracks, and it was very depressing and, and, you know, dark in there and everything. And I told my niece, I said, when we go to the barracks, I said, I need to go off by myself for a little bit. So she kind of stayed with the guide, and I kind of drifted off. I went back to an area that that was similar to what was in the dream, and I stand there looking at that, and, and I took a few pictures. But it wasn't until I turned to leave that barracks and just go step outside that I had a strange thing happen to where just before I got to the outdoors, I suddenly felt that I was Elena again. And I was kind of saying these things to myself about, you know, keep your head down, don't call attention to yourself, do whatever it takes to survive. And it was about that brief, and I stepped outside. And it was just a very strange step back to what, you know, I had done in that life probably on a daily basis really Mm -hmm. to think about surviving and that was pretty profound and I thought wow that's that the feelings of that came back again for just a little bit um it was a very very good trip for me I have to say and then did you um because you and I talked before going over that it would be at least something you could attempt if you felt led to to open up a portal and invite any other souls that needed to cross over still to do that and you right. did do that so tell me about that right. well that was uh, another kind of interesting thing our guide had left us and she would said there's a small little bookstore there, and she said you can go in there, and, and we went to the restroom, and my niece was still in there, and I came outside back into the camp, and I sat down on a cement railing for a little bit, and I was by myself, and 
I thought to myself, okay, you know, if this is something that, you know, you know, God, whatever God is, you know, is behind, then, you know, you need to find out. So I kind of said a prayer to God, you know, is this what it's supposed to be? Am I on the right track? At that moment, the sun came behind the clouds and rays came down at my feet. I also mm-hmm. thought then at that time about the souls leaving and did my thing that you had taught me. And at that time, white birds lifted up off of the field in front of me and took off. And I'd never noticed them before. Wonderful. You know, so I am so thrilled that you had this experience and that you were able to bring it to this sense of closure because you really have brought it to a whole different level of letting it all go. So that's our show for today. And I hate to even close because we could continue to talk about it. So I want to remind you that if you have any comments that you want to share or questions that you'd like me to address on upcoming shows, visit the Dead But Not Gone page here on BB. Global Network, or you can go to the Facebook page or email me, toby at sagebrushexchange.com. If you're involved in helping earthbound souls cross over and have something you'd like to share, I'd love to consider having you on the show. I welcome hearing from any of one of you. So join me next week when we'll be talking about the calling of being a crossing guard and how moving on large numbers of souls seems to be related to this time. Remember that we were made for these times, but we have to be dead on to step out of fear and into our highest vibration in order to wake up and do our part. We're all in this together, here to heal, reveal, and uplift the earth. Freeing those who are dead but not gone is ultimately freeing ourselves, as Cindy can attest to. We're all one. From BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, you have been listening to Dead But Not Gone. I'm your host, Toby Evans. Thank you so much, Cindy, for being with us tonight. Step up to wake up. Aho. You've been listening to Dead But Not Gone with your host, Toby Evans. Listen every week as Toby will explore and discover how your life is affected from beyond the here and now on the next episode of Dead But Not Gone. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.